Hello, welcome to Italics, the Italian American magazine. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. First on Italics, we'll get a head start on March, Women's History Month, and the centenary observance of one of the worst industrial accidents in our nation's history. On Saturday, March 25th, 1911, 146 people, mostly young teenage women working as seamstresses, died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City's Greenwich Village. A conflation of poor working conditions, coupled with obsolete and inadequate firefighting equipment, led to a scene of such horrific loss of life that only an event as devastating as the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center rivals it. We'll join Ruth Sergal and Marianne Trashati in a discussion about the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. The Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition was formed three years ago to coordinate the myriad groups and organizations that will hold observances of one of our nation's watershed events of labor and social history. Next, we'll go to Qatar Heroes, legendary craftsmen from Italy to New York, a new exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, featuring musical instruments created by Italian-American craftsmen, now running through July 1st. Then we'll go to see digital photographs of Italy, 1986 to 2010, the work of artist Frank Palaia, the curtain exhibition on view at the Galleria at the Calandra Institute. Now let's join Ruth Sergal and Marianne Trasciatti as they tell us why we should always remember the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. We have um, a network of over 140 organizations and partners who are all collaborating right. to create events for the centennial of this infamous fire. And um, the coalition has two main purposes. One is to help people network mm -hmm. to create events for the centennial. And the other um, is to create the memorial for the fire. The centennial events will be fabulous. And, and the anniversary uh, uh, commemorations that happen every year, not just in the 100th right. year, are in, in fact living, um, you know, kind of enacted memorials. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the more permanent memorial is, uh, in a, is a, a separate but related fundraising effort. Um, so, so uh, yeah, we'll really be looking for support mm -hmm. for that. Let's just talk briefly about the I mentioned that it was the deadliest in New York City, the fourth deadliest in um, in the United States, 146 people died, mostly mm. women, mostly immigrant women, and mm. mostly Jews and Italians. Mm. Some actually died throwing themselves from the ninth floor because there was no other way out. The mm. doors were locked yeah. shut. The, 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 the classic sweatshop mm. where people were literally in prison to work. Some of the union people have reminded us is that the, this was not exactly a, a sweatshop. I mean, these were okay. well-paid uh, garment workers, okay. but it was really the 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 um, the kind of circumventing safety codes uh, mm -hmm. or safety measures that could have been implemented. I think actually one thing that some people aren't aware of, uh, who even know about the Triangle Fire, mm -hmm. is that many of our fire safety laws actually come from this specific event. It was so shocking and horrifying to New York City and, and thus the nation that uh, many fire and safety laws were enacted in response to this. The American Society of Safety Engineers mm -hmm. was formed in response mm -hmm. to this in October of 1911. And so many of the things that we take for granted today actually come from this very specific event. Mm -hmm. um, and New York City, frankly, and the state took the lead in implementing that, and then the rest of the country so followed. followed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with um, human rights, we're dealing with workers' rights. Right. Yeah, we're dealing with other issues too. We're dealing with gender Women's issues. Women's work, right. right. We're dealing with right. gender issues. We're dealing with ethnicity. When you consider that we've got a predominance of Jews and Italian, mm -hmm. immigrant women, and their and their daughters, basically. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, before the fire, there was a lot of different communities who had so many little fights between them that they couldn't work together to create positive change. And once the fire happened, it was so shocking that people just dropped their differences and came together mm -hmm. and created immense change. Um, mm -hmm. Francis Perkins witnessing the fire and then mm -hmm. being one of the mm -hmm. authors essentially of the New Deal. Yeah. And I feel like actually the way we can most honor the fire today, 100 years later, is to um, hopefully reflect that kind of activity back and try to make positive change here in this country and also kind of the ground zero for the garment industry today, which is in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. which has so many similar problems, mm -hmm. which we can so understand from our own experience. Triangle is also important um, because it, it 
reminds us of how connected we are to people in other places, like yeah. in Bangladesh. But it also is, you know, it's an important moment in American labor history, and, and we really suffer from amnesia when it comes to labor history. Yeah. I mean, people don't remember that, that things like weekends and workmen's comp, and they didn't exist mm -hmm. uh, until unions fought mm -hmm. for them. And, and one of the tragic things about Triangle is that, you know, there was a strike prior to this, and, and women were, were bonding mm -hmm. together to, to, to struggle for mm -hmm. better working conditions and safety. And the owners of Triangle resisted uh, those reforms, mm -hmm. and, and it became more difficult to do that afterwards. And, and so I think we need to remember the history of working people in the United States. And that's mm -hmm. part of what we'd like to do with the memorial, mm -hmm. is, to, is to celebrate, um, in particular, to working women, um, but working people generally, uh, that, that these their struggles are important, and they continue to be important mm -hmm. around the world today. And, and you know we need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many people, I, I, just talking, particularly to women, but, but men too, how many people are, are recall their own family history yeah, when you ask sure. them, oh, my grandmother was a seamstress, yeah. or my great aunt, and, and it wasn't at Triangle. My own mother was a garment worker, not yeah. at Triangle, and has told me more than once that kept me safe. Yeah. Triangle kept me safe. So it's part of lots of people's family histories, especially if you are mm -hmm. Italian-American or Jewish. I think two-thirds of the needle trades in New York were Jewish, and a third mm -hmm. were Italian-American, but, but not just in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was a big industry. Yeah. And so yeah. it's part of everybody's history, really, in a way. Yeah. And I remember, actually, as a kid, the big roles that used to come into the dress shop with right. the uh, International Lady Garment Union, yeah. the little right. squares. And they used to cut them, and there was somebody who used to sew them in. They would exactly. sew them in. Exactly. And remember the song they used to have yeah. that commercial yeah. for the union <laughs> label? Look for the union label when you are buying a coat dress or bra. Remember somewhere, our union sewing, our wages going to be the king. So, I mean, it's, you know, when, when we ask people to donate and mm -hmm. when they give, it's really reclaiming yeah. and celebrating and your own history. And people need to know that it's there's never too little to give absolutely really mm -hmm. I mean, or too know, much or too <laughs> much <There's no laughs> well done. The, i think you were in the film pani amato mm -hmm. right and uh, which is about the italians in general the first 50 years of italians in the 20th century but Gian, uh, gianfranco norelli spends a good amount of time on on the fire there are a couple of other movies i think that were made right um about the a couple of other documentaries about the shirtwaist fire well, the Ken Burns documentary yeah. about New York has about a New segment York. on the yeah. farms. Sorry. Rick Burns. No, no, I'm sorry. You're yeah. right. Absolutely right. The yeah. Rick Burns documentary. And also the, the, the Keel Center website um, okay. has, is a rich repository uh, of materials. Um, Unfortunately, I think it, it where it's a little weak, and, and I don't think this is the fault of the Kiel Center, is there aren't a lot of materials for, for people who might be interested in the sort of Italian uh, or Italian-American mm -hmm. um, uh, aspect, um, mm -hmm. newspapers, uh, etc., um, and I think that that, that w we could do a better job of making yeah. it available to people. But that's work that we have to do. But but that's mm -hmm. certainly there. And then the the you might want to talk about the yeah. There's there's two other new documentaries that are okay. coming out for the centennial. Uh, HBO and Blowback Productions okay. will have a f a new film um, that premieres in March. And starting in February, actually later this month, American Experience has a documentary okay. as well. So I think people are really um, making And that information also will be on it's your website? It's all on our website, yes. Okay. <laughs> March 25th, Workers United always hosts the official commemoration right. at the site. Uh, mm -hmm. at the, at the building is still there. It was fireproof. Mm -hmm. So um, at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's sort of the center, and everything kind of emanates out mm -hmm. from there. We maintain an online calendar that everybody can add to it. Right. Remember the trianglefire.org? Mm -hmm. And so there is stuff through next week, and then we also host um, open meetings the third Thursday of every month. Right. <clears throat> Please come to our open meeting on February 17th, because okay. that's the best way to get okay. immediately linked in and mm -hmm. find like-minded folks. Mm -hmm. um, to Yes Please, you can always go to our website and donate mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> through yeah. PayPal, and we really appreciate it. We're very, um, we spread every dollar very far, as far as can possibly Absolutely. go. Um, and we really want to see this memorial get built. Mm -hmm. um, but really, the thing that's going to get the memorial built is people power. And so having people come to the events and get linked in and find like-minded people who are going to work past the centennial, mm -hmm. um, because that's going to be the challenge. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of excitement about the centennial, but we really want to create this people's memorial uh, for the future mm -hmm. generations. Thanks.
And we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you. Great. Now we'll take you to a preview of Guitar Heroes, legendary craftsmen from Italy to New York, a new exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. Curator Jason Keir Dobney tells us about the exhibition and the tradition of Italian-American and Italian looters, creators of stringed instruments, which traces back to Italy and specifically Naples. Mr. Dobney will also be a speaker in the Calandra Institute's Philip Conestrao Lecture Series this coming March 9 at 6 p.m. In the late 18th century, Naples was the largest city on the Italian peninsula and one of the largest cities in all of Europe. It had a vibrant musical culture, including a thriving operatic tradition, and had been a center for the production of harpsichords for 200 years. By mid-century, Neapolitan luthiers were also gaining prominence. Important innovations in the manufacture of violins, guitars, and mandolins helped Naples remain the most important center in Italy for the production of string instruments through the 19th century. Around the turn of the 20th century, millions of Italians immigrated to the United States. Metropolitan New York became the major Italian-American center, home to a large number of immigrants from southern Italy who brought with them their culture, including their music and musical instruments. Between 1880 and 1920, thousands of mandolins were imported from Italy, and many luthiers moved to New York and began manufacturing the instruments locally. Well, I've been very interested for a long time in this tradition of New York makers from the Italian heritage building these beautiful archtop instruments, especially guitars and mandolins, and the long tradition right in and around New York City. And I knew about this even before I came to New York, and I just thought, I'm here in the city, I'm, I want to see if I can put this project together. So nearly immediately, within the first six months of me being at the museum, I pitched the show. and. Um, everybody agreed that this is a perfect thing for us to show here in New York City. Focus is on three craftsmen who really were three different generations of builders. The first one was named John D'Angelico, and he was born in the Lower East Side, Little Italy, in 1905. And he studied as a um, mandolin builder with the old mandolin guys that were still here from Naples at the time. His uncle owned a shop on Kenmare Street, and he learned all of this Italian skill from him. And then as music styles changed and the, the Neapolitan mandolins became less popular, he started building something called an uh, archtop guitar, which is, has some violin characteristics like an arched top and back, um, a free floating bridge with a tailpiece and F holes. And he quickly became recognized in the jazz world where they normally use these instruments as a premier maker. D'Angelico made a, a great rhythm guitar, that's what we called them. And this is one of them right here. This is uh, probably 1932 and it was used in a big band uh, just to play chords.
And that's what the people danced to, and they, they never realized that it was the rhythm section that they were dancing to more so than in a band. In a pawn shop window on 8th Avenue were two D'Angelico New Yorkers, just stunning instruments that were hanging there with for sale signs on them. And so for like $600 and my Fender Jaguar, which I was no longer playing, I became the owner of this blonde uh, D'Angelico New Yorker. The instrument just, oh my God, it was, you played one note on it and it was so alive and vibrant and so filled with musical promise. And that became uh, a powerful vein of um, uh, uh, introduction and receptivity for me to go deeper into music than I ever had before. Somehow, as I played this instrument, what it gave in return was um, irresistible. And he quickly became recognized in the jazz world where they normally use these instruments mm -hmm. as a premier maker. So he became very established and he worked um, until he died in 1964. Now he did train an apprentice and his name was James DeQuisto and he's the second artist in the exhibition. He worked for 12 years with John D'Angelico and then um, after, De after D'Angelico's death James DeQuisto moved the shop to Long Island and he really was one of the great jazz builders of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He built for all the 52nd Street musicians. Famous players like Jim Hall um, really loved James DeQuisto's work. And he also took the instrument in new directions. He took the traditional instrument that was really a jazz box and he opened up the aesthetic. He started doing wild colors and shapes and natural materials, really making each piece a work of art. I mean, every one of these guitars is custom built, but his work, he really took it to the next level and he opened the world up to guitar players and makers. And he died in 1995. Um, and then the third maker was friends with DeQuisto. His name is John Monteleone and he's still living. And he, grew, he came of age at a time when there was very little market for Archtop instruments, acoustic instruments of any sort. And so he didn't have a traditional apprenticeship. He actually taught himself by looking at instruments, by befriending guys like James DeQuisto. And he started building archtop mandolins, which are similarly based on violin technology for bluegrass musicians and folk musicians in the 1970s. And then uh, became very famous for this work. And the last several decades has become equally famous for his guitars. I like the guitar. If you're able to just look at it and not play it, to vibrate. That to me is like an instrument that is already in motion without even touching it. And now visually that's what, what the excitement is all about. And you, now you walk up and you play this instrument and it gives you this other dimension. It's, like, it's, a, it's incredible that uh, an instrument is so unique in that really if you pair all, everything down to one essential it's got to play music. That's what it does. It's a music box. And that's what makes it as an art object really unique because it behaves like no other art object there is. It's not like a painting. It's not like a sculpture, a statue, a piece of jewelry. Uh, in, in that sense where it's a one-dimensional kind of an item, a guitar is multi-dimensional. And where John was coming from, his guitars kind of covered all the bases because they weren't just, you know, strictly a certain, that old kind of arch top, kind of sharp, direct sound, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't the, uh, just the, the flat top sound, it was sort of in between. So to me, it was just, you know, looking for a guitar that I could play something is, you know, some, some, some kind of raunchy blues kind of. And the guitar would kick back. And then something also very sweet. We'd hear. We had that articulation and the, the intonation and that perfection of tone. So it kind of, you know, it just covered all the bases. It was a clean palette to work from.
Next, we'll see the work of artist Frank Palaya, Digital Photographs of Italy, 1986 to 2010, the current exhibition on view at the Calandra Institute's Galleria. Mr. Palaya uses Polaroid photography as the basis for works in which he paints and employs collage to create vibrant new visions of Italian landscapes and images. Frank Palaya's family immigrated to the United States from Calabria, Italy in 1949 to 1950 and settled in New Rochelle, New York. From an early age, Palaya vowed to travel to Italy and he did so many times throughout the course of his life. During his year-long Rome Fellowship Prize at the American Academy in Rome, Palaya took hundreds of Polaroids of the ancient city. His experiments with hand coloring those Polaroids have been compiled into an exhibit which is now on display here at the Calander Institute in New York City. This particular series always intrigues people and I, and I can understand why because they start out as uh, SX-70 Polaroids. Where, which they don't even make them anymore. Um, they're totally um, impossible to find, although I think in Europe you can buy uh, Polaroid film. But these are the uh, three by three inch instant prints that would pop out of your camera and they were just brilliant, brilliant design and idea. And I just fell in love with it just because it was so instant and the colors were very brilliant. And uh, I love the small, square shape. Uh, it, it just had a purity about it. And uh, I kind of came upon this technique by accident. I uh, got a Polar I received a Polaroid sponsorship for several years and what they do is they give artists film and cameras. Rather than money, they give them film. They let the artists do their magic on their film and then they, uh, the artist gives some prints to, to Polaroid Corporation for their collection, which is huge and really important. And uh, so I was lucky to have this sponsorship for this particular technique where I would hand color the Polaroids with uh, a special kind of refined oil crayon, Caran d'Ache it's called. And I only kind of stumbled upon it because I had some old packs of film that were expired. And I'm very resourceful and frugal. I don't want to waste anything, so I put them in the camera anyway. And they came out kind of bad, you know, with a lot of missing blotches and faded areas. And I said, ah. So I thought, you know, gee, I'm an artist. I can fix things, you know? So I started hand coloring them, and voila. And I've been doing these since uh, 1981. I have literally probably thousands of these. This is a small sampling of some of the uh, ones that I like. My travels started in 1985 when I received the Rome Prize Fellowship and I uh, had a one year in Rome and so I had plenty of time to take lots of Polaroid photographs of Italy. So the images here are from all over Italy from Sardinia to uh, Puglia to um, Venezia. What I do is when I, after I hand color the photographs, the Polaroids, I, uh, since there's no negative, uh, they're uh, scanned and then I uh, print them to this size. And then I go uh, much further than this. I take them uh, two or three sizes bigger and I print them even up to three by three feet. They're amazingly identical to this, to these small ones. And then I go one step further, I print them to four by four feet and I make them into transparencies and I put them into light boxes. So that's, uh, that's sort of the end of the road I think for now, but I'll come up with another variation. And if you're interested in seeing the light boxes, the Polaroid light boxes, I'm going to be in a new art fair on Pier 92. It's in March, end of March, called The Artist's Project. And I'm going to have a booth there and I'm going to have um, all Polaroids, the big ones and the illuminated ones. So. During the exhibit opening, Frank Palaya was generous to show us the process of creating some of his works. Now, there are only three originals. Just I, I put them here so you can see what they look like. Uh, the original size and a hand color. And this is the enlarger. That's the Pantheon. This is in Oreste, Italy. It's a little north of Rome. It needed something and I have had this little stuck there. And then you can even read all that little uh, graffiti there. This is actually two Polaroids. I cut one Polaroid and stuck it on one of them. It has that weird De Chirico perspective, you know, in his paintings. 
but the, the windows are a little bit off, you know. That's why it's the careful wolf. Well, this is another kind of iconic Italian um, structure. It's really uh, one. It's probably the best example of that kind of a bit structure. Uh, this was really old film. This this one was ten years past its expiration date, and that's why it is so so total delightful and kind of messed up. Yeah. 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 You made the light. Be sure to catch Frank Pelaya's Digital Polaroids of Italy on display at the Calandra Institute in New York City through April 1st, 2011. Well, that's it for this edition of Italics. Thanks for watching. I'm Anthony Tamburri. See you next time. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.